Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series. My name is Bill Nichols, and I am the team lead for the software engineering and measurement and analysis here at the SEI. Today, I am joined by Dr. Anandi Hira, a data scientist on our team who is here today to talk about software cost estimation, how it works, and why we need it. Welcome, Dr. Hira. Thank you, and feel free to just call me Anandi. Well, great. Anandi, welcome back to the podcast series. Earlier this year, you and I sat down with Suzanne Miller to discuss capability-based planning for early stage software development. We will provide a link to that podcast in our transcript. For those members of the audience who didn't catch that episode, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? What brought you to the SCI and what do you love about uh, software estimation and planning? Sure. So I'm Anandi. Uh, usually I pronounce my name Anandi uh, as well. It's a lot easier for people to remember and say, and that's perfectly fine with me. So I came from USC. I did a PhD with Dr. Barry Baim in software cost estimation. Um, I had, when I was in undergrad, I had the thought that I wanted to get a PhD. I didn't really know what in, but I started looking at PhD programs uh, near where I would be comfortable going to school in, like in the area I wanted to be in. And I saw Dr. Baim's program. And one thing I really liked about computer science was just the logic and how everything um, came together and worked together. So for example, you first learn programming, but then you learn about how that gets converted to assembly language. And then we learned you know, about computer systems and then how all of the seven layers work together. So it was just an expansion on that what I enjoyed, which is looking at software kind of in the business realm and from a higher perspective, as far as how software kind of works in that business realm, you know, doing economic analysis of whether something's feasible or has good return on investment. Um, so anyway, I thought it was really interesting and I applied into Dr. Baim's program and, you know, here I am years later uh, doing software cost estimation. Um, I really enjoy being at the SEI. I just started here about two and a half years ago now, or maybe it's just exactly two years ago now. Um, I get to work with amazingly smart people, you included Bill, um, Chris Miller as well, and I get to help people with software cost estimation, planning, measurement, um, all of these interesting topics. Now, you mentioned working for Barry Bain, and I'm not sure if everyone in the audience recognizes his contributions or what he did. Can you talk just a little bit about what made Barry Bain's program unique? Yes, Dr. Barry Bain uh, had a very unique perspective as far as his background. He himself had come from working in industry primarily and then came to USC as a professor. So while he was an academic, he was also someone who worked in industry. So something that I noticed was really unique and um, impactful about his program and the research that all of his, his students were doing was that one, it did have academic relevance but it also had practical, you know, useful impact on industry. And so software cost estimation being one of them. So some of his biggest contributions were the spiral model and coming up with the first software cost estimating model, which was published in his 1981 software engineering economics book. He then continued working on it after he started the PhD program at USC. So that is Kokomo 2, which was published in, I think, 2000 or 2001 um, in his, it's a, we usually called it the Red Book. 
And that was, I believe, named Software Cost Estimation with Kokomo 2. And he has also done research in other areas like risk management, um, some of the later work that he was doing. So some of the students that were with me were looking at the illities, so like maintainability, security, um, reliability, and how they were all interconnected. And he just really got interested in everything, I would say everything related to software engineering and software development in that kind of business realm and addressing all of the topics that managers and organizations would have when they are developing software. If I understand you correctly, you're talking about Mary's work, not necessarily addressing, can I build this from a technical standpoint, but can I build this in the sense that, do we have enough money? Do we have the right people? How long is this going to take? Exactly. Making sure in a way, and this is how I interpret it. I'm sure other people have different perspectives or how they look at it, but looking at the entire environment of, do we have an environment that can support and uh, bring success to our endeavor here? And so it's really looking at the business, it's looking at the financial aspect, but it's also looking at management aspects. Um, so one of the principles in his spiral model, which was then updated to the incremental commitment spiral model, ICSM, if you look at his book, it's a little smaller white book. Um, his first principle is a win-win negotiation, you know, which is a management and uh, dealing with people kind of principle. And so if you look at his work, it really addresses all aspects related to management and creating an environment that can help your software be a success, but also determining whether you do have what's required for success and what you can do to improve it. Okay, let's follow up a little bit on that. Uh, tell us a little bit about software estimation. What are the things that you typically estimate and how do you go about building the model? So with software cost estimation, I would say it is much like trying to predict and estimate um, anything else really. Uh, trying to build a model requires understanding how the environment that it is in works and what are the parameters that you would use to build the model or that represents the relationships that we see uh, playing out. So for example, I think this would be a very relatable example, uh, which is if you had any kind of remodeling work done at your home, um, specifically, I'm just gonna go with flooring. I think that's the basic. So if you've ever asked contractors or people, you know, how much would it cost for me to redo my floor or put in a new floor? The first question you're usually going to get asked is, well, what is the square footage of the area that you want to have your floors replaced? And that is the major cost driver or determiner of how much it's going to cost, is how much space or how much flooring is needed. And then there are going to be other factors. For example, what kind of floor do you want? You know, is it going to be a hardwood floor? Is it going to be tile? And then once you figure out what kind of flooring, you know, then there's going to be a spectrum of, you know, more expensive options versus less expensive options. And then there are a lot of other factors. So the main components of building a model for something like that is determining what is the size metric? What is the major aspect of the job that is going to determine how much this job is going to cost. So something that can, like flooring, tell us, you know, how much space do we need to cover? How much work is required? And a lot of it is going to be based on how much area needs to be covered, because that's going to determine the number of hours it's going to take to, for example, remove your existing floor and then put in a new flooring. And then it's going to go into now what kind of flooring. So that what kind of flooring and other aspects we would consider kind of parameters or drivers or factors as far as additional components that are needed to get a more accurate estimate. So you're gonna have the type of flooring, 
um, the type of labor that goes into that, the amount of scrap material you may need uh, to be able to get the right shapes and you know get your floor to exactly cover your floor. So these are all additional factors that would be needed in addition to the size metric to get to build or develop a model. So the same thing is in software cost estimation. We need to determine what does developing software look like? How can we determine how much time we need to build software? So one of the size metrics that has been used since, since this concept of software cost estimation was developed is source lines of code or SLOC. So that's estimating the number of lines of code that you have to develop that was the most uh, logical output of the software development process. So that's why that is used as the software metric or size metric, um, at least until, you know, until other size metrics have come up. And you can come up with a different determiner for your size metric. It doesn't have to be SLOC. And then you have factors. So in the software development world, uh, the factors are things like uh, what is the complexity of the software that you have to develop? So is the software itself that we're developing easier or harder? It's going to take less or more time correspondingly. Then you have things like your development environment. So the uh, developers that you have working on them, how experienced they are. Then you have uh, things like the processes that you're using. So are they documenting their assumptions well or you know more modernly are they applying agile or devops and are they um are they being flexible with requirements and having code constantly uh, built and tested you know so that they have less to integrate all at once um, so basically, are they are they using good practices or best practices for development? And then you have outside impact. For example, if your team is all in the same place versus you know across the country or across the world, that's going to impact your productivity. If you're all in the same place, you can work with each other. You can get answers, questions quickly. Versus when you're across the world, you know you have time zone differences. And so the, a lot of these things that can impact how quickly or less quickly we can develop software would be your factors. Now, you said something that's kind of interesting. You talked about using source lines of code as a, a basis for predicting the total effort, which makes perfect sense, except unlike, uh, unlike square footage on your floor, you don't really know the source lines of code until you've built them. How, how do you come around this problem? Yes, that has been the biggest, I would say, challenge with software cost estimation is trying to determine the size metric for software because software, it's not physical like, you know, like flooring and a lot of the things that we do um, in the real world, I guess, or, you know, hardware type things. So it's not physical. You don't have a good idea of how many lines of code you have you need to build something. And as time has moved from, you know, like early 1960s, where we used to have to develop actual code, we have a repository of existing code. And now we have this culture and we have all of this software, existing software, we have services, we have COTS, which is commercial off the shelf software. Um, so you are not necessarily building all of the software that we necessarily have in our finished product. So more and more estimating our effort in terms of source lines of code has become a bigger and bigger challenge. Um, even if we were to develop everything from scratch, it's still a big challenge, but now it just becomes a bigger and bigger challenge. It doesn't really indicate the effort that we do have to put in software development anymore. So there have been software met size metrics that have been developed over the years. For example, function points that was developed in 1979. And there have been uh, various variants on the IFPUG function points over the years. 
Um, we have also had use case points that showed up when as a way to use use cases as a way to determine our software sizing. Um, I would not call this a software sizing metric, but there's also story points, which comes from the agile uh, poker planning exercise where they tried to use a numbering system to determine how difficult a project is or a task is, or a user story rather, how difficult a user story is and how much time it might require to develop that particular user story. So there are multiple, and there are many other software size metrics that have been developed. Um, I did do a high level summary of them and I have an image in my PhD dissertation that kind of lists the different software size metrics and how they map to the software lifecycle development model and the things that you know as far as the phases are. So for example, you know, requirements, which of the software size metrics map well to requirements versus architecture versus the other phases. Um, so if you're interested, you could take a look. That lists some more software size metrics than what I just now listed. And if you were to look at the existing research and literature, you will find many, many more that have been developed to improve the way that we can estimate our software size and therefore effort. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, now, you've talked about the problem of size as one of the more fundamental issues in software cost estimation. What are the various tools? Can you give us some examples of the different tools that are used today? And what are some of the problems using them? So there are a few that are um, available for people to use, either proprietary or open source, and not open source, but open available models. So Dr. Bame's Kokomo models, that's the one I'm trying to refer to as being openly available. If you have the books or you are able to find the equations from elsewhere, the model is uh, completely explained in his books. So therefore anyone can implement it and use the model. There are some other tools that exist as well that are proprietary based. So you'd have to get in touch with them um, they probably charge according to the type of license that you get. But some of the major ones are Searsum by Galarath and True Planning by what is now Unison. Now, all of these tools do use source lines of code as their primary software sizing method. Um, Kokomo did have, they used research that was done um, as far as trying to convert function points to source lines of code, and then it uses that in their model. So in a way, they, the Kokomo allows you to use function points, and this would be Kokomo 2, the updated version, um, but not directly. Now, True Planning and Searsum both allow for multiple software size metrics, and that can be function points among some of the others like use case points. In your blog post, you stated that you chose not to focus on the components required to support a software system. Uh, for example, components, external services, the supporting hardware. Uh, but these are not accounted for in software development estimates. Can you explain why you made the decision not to include them? Yeah, well, it's not just I who made the decision, um, it's everyone that develops these software cost estimating tools. So as you may recall, we talked about how we need a way to have a metric, a size metric to determine the amount of work that's required. And that kind of determines by a huge part how much cost and effort it's going to take to do that work. And so since we're using typically source lines of code or even function points, for example, to determine the amount of work for software development, that doesn't necessarily correlate with these other components like uh, supporting hardware. So usually we have to divide it up because you have different approaches to estimate, you know, anything outside of the software development effort. 
So we have to divide it up and use other means to estimate those costs. So for example, if we're using um, existing software services, then you would have the price it would require to get the license for your use. Um, if you have supporting hardware, then again, it would be the cost of how much hardware uh, that you would need. So Anandi, what is next for you? When we bring you back here in a few months, what are we gonna be talking about? Well, I am planning to continue this, uh, kind of create a blog series. So this first blog that we've been referring to was just the basics of software cost estimation um, and what we went over in today's podcast. So we did touch a little bit on software size metrics. So I plan to do another blog series or blog post that talks about software size metrics in particular, the pros and cons, and when you would be able to use them, things like that and kind of get more into detail about the issues that kind of revolve around software cost estimation um, and then go into some possible solutions and some new ideas on how we might be able to approach software cost estimation. Well, Anandi, thank you for talking with us today. For the audience, in the transcripts, we will include links to resources mentioned in this podcast, including the blog post uh, Anandi provided earlier this year. Finally, a reminder to the audience that our podcasts are available pretty much any place you can access a podcast, including SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, as well as the SEI's YouTube channel. If you like what you see in here today, please give us a thumbs up. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.